Hey everybody and welcome to this week's episode of Maddie's Mental Health Podcast. This week's episode is a little bit different. We did a crossover podcast with guest Logan McLean. I was also on his podcast and that is the OJT Podcast. This is an interview-based podcast about passion projects. It's a place where people can talk about what they're an expert in and that is themselves. It's also a place for the host, a journalist student, to explore what it means to make independent media. Interviews come out every two weeks, and news stories come out in the off weeks. You can find the OJT podcast and stream it at ojtpod.ca and everywhere you can stream. You can also find written work on the website, and you can find the host on all social medias under Logan McLean. Definitely go check it out, guys. It was a great podcast. We chatted about physical and mental health. I really enjoyed it, and I really think um, he's doing a great thing with his show. This week on Maddie's Mental Health Podcast, he talks about living with Crohn's for most of his life and how that affected him. Uh, I think it's super interesting. I hope you enjoy it, and thanks so much for listening. Woo. Logan McLean is here today. How are you doing, Logan? Good, Maddie. Glad to be here, man. Glad to have you on, man. Um, you do the OJT podcast. That's right. I've been doing that for a little while. Um, we did an interview a little while ago. Hopefully, it'll be out at the time of this release yeah um and um yeah man i've really enjoyed uh doing the interview and um and chatting um and you told me like a little bit about your story and uh just want to thanks say thanks for coming on and being willing to share i appreciate it it's important to do this kind of stuff i think for sure um yeah let's get right into it um you can jump right in wherever you like sure um, well, the main thing I'm probably going to talk about is uh, living with Crohn's disease, uh, which is a chronic inflammatory bowel disease that I've had since I was 11. Um, it's caused a lot of mental problems along with the physical struggle. Uh, but before I get into that, I'll just kind of, I'm not going to tell you my entire story, uh, but I've always been a very emotional person to the point of it being a problem. Um, I, I was not kicked out of my first kindergarten, but it was like kind of a Catholic kindergarten. I was just around the time when the uh, cutoff age changed and, uh, I had what would now be called panic attacks every single day when I was dropped off. Uh, they called it a tantrum and just thought I was a little brat. So right. that kind of stuff, um, it's kind of gone on my entire life, just, uh, uncontrollable, you know, emotional outbursts. Uh, as I've gotten older, they've been able to put some names on it, but it's uh, it's always been kind of the thing. Um, it so what were these episodes, sorry to cut you off, what were these episodes yeah. like when you were a kid? Like, uh, so like, was it when your parents like dropped you off? Yeah. And then you'd be like, kind of like uh, uh, an emotional outburst, like, cause they're leaving you there. Yeah, it was like separation anxiety, um, not understanding why am I here, um, and just the, a lot of it was simply that I don't, you know, being four years old, I don't really remember what I was upset about, but it was just that I would get upset and they would just put me in the hall. Like, there's no, <laughs> what's wrong, you know, what's the underlying <laughs> issue here? Why does this four-year-old have a fucking panic disorder? <laughs> Um, it was just, no, you're a brat, go sit in the hallway until you calm down. Um, and that was, that's one of my earliest memories is just like that kind of treatment around little boys having potential mental health issues. It's just like, you're just acting up, you know, you're just being a, a shithead and right. it didn't stop when I left kindergarten. Cause like, I've never done, I do well in school now because I like it, but if right, it just didn't make sense to me back then. Like I didn't you know, apply yourself or didn't want to, or had no didn't interest want to, and didn't understand why you would have to. Yeah, I liked to read and stuff when we were like, I don't know, learning grade two stuff, and teachers want you to. I don't know. I don't really remember, but that's along that area is where I started noticing that, like, oh, I might not be kind of like everybody else who seems to be able to you know, do normal person stuff without losing their mind. But. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, 
so did that kind of continue? Like, so going from kindergarten, did that continue through like childhood where you would have like the separation anxiety or these outbursts? It did. Yeah. Um, I had a lot of trouble with making friends for most of elementary school uh, for that reason. Like you've been around young boys, somebody starts crying, everybody piles on top of them. Um, right, yeah. I, I did it to people too. I very remember very clearly every time I got my chance, I jumped on too. It's what people did. Um, I'm sure it still right. happens, but yeah. it's made it hard to trust people because it's like I would, you know, be even remotely vulnerable around people that I trusted and then they would immediately take that and use it against me. Right. So would you find that you would be emotional like with relationships that you had with friends or potential friends or yeah, not so much. I think because of that broken trust where it's like, again, it's so much of this remembering stuff from being a kid is half remembering half, you know, kind of projecting your current life onto the past to try and understand it. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, yeah no, it's funny. And memory is a funny thing because when you really think about it, like you're just like, I got like three memories from like a year, maybe. You know, you just have like these sporadic little pictures in your mind. And then I think it gets kind of like twisted over time. Like you interpret them differently. Yeah. Like you said, like you look at it through, through your eyes now. So, yeah, it's interesting how memory works. Yeah. Um, I guess uh, in grade six is when I got diagnosed with Crohn's disease. And um, okay, did you have like, was that like a big leading up to it with with uh, symptoms? Yeah, I was pretty sick for like six or eight months. I actually lost uh, somewhere around 40, 50 pounds. Like holy shit! At the, how at the age how of much like did you weigh at the time? How, how I was old, a little or, overweight. Uh, yeah, I was somewhere close to like. I think it was, I went from like 130 down to 190 or from 130 to 90 or something like that. Right. In just a couple of months. Um, wow. And I don't remember being scared though, which is interesting. I remember everybody around me was like, what's happening to this kid? And I was just like, it hurts. <laughs> and I want to go watch wrestling. <laughs> like that's most of what I remember. Right. Um, it, <laughs> yeah. It, it took a couple of years for it to become one of those like, oh, this is what they mean by chronic. Like, it's game-changing. Not going away. Yeah, it's going to stay. And yeah. that's, that's where the many of the issues that I deal with now come from is that childhood trauma of, you know, having kind of poor relationships with people, not being able to build trust, coupled with, uh, you know, hospitalizations, uh, constant broken trust from doctors and therapists and you know the medical system i guess i shouldn't comment on it too much but it has at least personally let me down um and uh so it's crohn's is one of those things where you kind of in constant pain but it doesn't hurt all the time uh and the fact that like that's the kind of stuff that makes it so hard on the head. If you burn yourself, it just hurts and it hurts and it hurts until it heals. Crohn's is one of those things where it hurts off and on better and worse. And it'll go away almost entirely for weeks or months at a time. Uh, I have underlying symptoms that'll never go away. I had ostomy surgery a couple of years ago. So I have a, a bag, um, stuff like that. I, I can't ever forget about, but, um, like it's, it messes with me so much because I'll get settled into normal life. And then as soon as I start to do something, it'll just come back and completely knock me off my feet. And, um, (laughs) the toughest thing is that I take medication for it. Uh, it's called Stelera. It's a needle that actually, it's interesting. It actually kind of turns off a part of the immune system because the way Crohn's works, it's the immune system attacking itself. Um, but when those things stop working, I usually lose 40 to 50 pounds like that, like happened originally. Um, before I'd had my surgery a couple of years ago, I, but in the span of three years, I think I gained and lost, and this is not an exaggeration, somewhere around 300 pounds. 
like in chunks of 50 from getting healthy, and, getting sick, getting healthy, getting sick over and over. And how, and what was the time span? Like three Did years. That yeah. Holy fuck, man. That's rough. Yeah. So that's, that's super- go, ahead. go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. It just makes it, I'm a, you know, a fairly ambitious person. I have a lot of interests and oftentimes I'm kind of stuck watching people my age pass me by because um, they don't have Crohn's. You know, everybody has a lot of different problems and, uh, you know, I'm sitting here, white boy in Canada, I'm nearly as privileged as they get, except the fact that I have a permanent invisible disability and it's, it, yeah, messes with your head, man. Yeah, yeah, it, Wow, it really does. Um, and we talked a little bit about the show. Like I was telling you that I had, uh, I don't have Crohn's, but I have like, uh, I've had gut problems. Um, it really started since I was like 16. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with a condition called SIBO. It's called, it's a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Okay. But I had that from 16 until 24. And I got diagnosed when I was like around 22. But I really didn't find like the right doctor till I was like 24 and I had to go on meds for like three months, just constantly on meds. And, uh, it was like this whole process of like diet and supplementation and stuff. And like, now it's finally starting to get to a point where it's like better. And I, like, it's the whole thing. I mean, you, you know all about it, but it's like diet every day and doing everything perfect. Um, but you know, it wasn't Crohn's, but, uh, I can just relate from that time, uh, to the chronic pain. And, uh, it really does mess with your head. And like, like you said, like you just, every time you start doing something, I felt like that too. Like it was like, I was just like, cause I'm ambitious too. Like I like to do a lot of things and then you, your mind is like just 10 steps ahead from where your body can take you, which is just yeah. very, uh, it can be very, um, discouraging and, uh, frustrating and, just being sick right because you, you know yeah. who wants to be sick when you you know you, you want to be ambitious in full life and then you're uh you, you're forced to you know do nothing pretty much yeah well that being sick that's where the mental health part comes in is that um a lot of periods of my life i haven't seen myself as you know a young man so much as a patient i've spent i've only been hospitalized a couple of times uh, but that's mostly from stubbornness. Um, a lot of people go to the hospital a lot for Crohn's, but they, there's not actually that much they can do. They give you some IV fluids and opiate painkillers if you beg them, but those don't actually help because they cause constipation. So it does not help digestive issues to take opiates. Um, yeah. Yeah. But like I, I refuse to wear a Johnny shirt unless you're cutting me open. Like I have had so much time in waiting rooms and it, it's severely dehumanizing. Um, like when people, when, when the pandemic started and people were all going on about, I'm never going to wear pants again, you know, I don't need to wear pants to work. And all I could think was, uh, how much it meant to me when I got home from being in the hospital for a month to finally be able to wear my own clothes again, to have the dignity wow. of a grown man, to not wear fucking pajamas in hospital clothes. Like, yeah. So it's, uh, wow. That's a really interesting perspective on it. It's actually something I encourage people to do. It doesn't come up very often, but, uh, if you're going into the hospital, wear your own clothes as long as you can, because the minute you change into that Johnny shirt, you're a patient until they let you out and they might not let you out. (laughs) They might decide you're a danger to yourself or others and call the fucking cops on you. Like I've, it's, it's scary, honestly. When you, when you get into the medical system, uh, there's this perception that the safety net is strong. Once you start getting in there and realize that, oh, shit, they don't have a cure for my disease. Uh, they've already done the surgeries that they're willing to do until it gets worse. They've tried all the medications. The last appointment I had, my doctor told me, uh, this is a paraphrase, but he told me essentially, the only thing left for you is stress management which is the most stressful thing I had been told in quite a while. Yes. Yeah. And you talk about, uh, you know, and just from what you said there, kind of like a a feeling of being let down by the medical system. And uh, 
could you maybe describe that from like you kind of your whole experience from a whole and like i know with with gut issues like same thing for me i felt very very fucking uh I'm getting angry too. <laughs> I, felt, I felt very, very like let down and misled and like pretty much told that like they can't help me. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the main issue comes from shortages in staffing. Um, I think people who are working as nurses and doctors are trying their damn best with the occasional exceptions as you find anywhere. But uh, medical science has advanced quite a bit and people's willingness to go to see doctors, especially to see mental health professionals now has drastically improved, but the support system and the resources have not kept up pace with that. Um, right. so that now there are, it's massive waiting lists combined with the fact that you might not even get what you want by the end of that wait list, you know, yeah. especially when it comes to mental health services where it's so personal. You, you know, you go to a doctor about a broken bone, it doesn't really matter if you like the guy. If he can set the bone and give you an x-ray, that's it. But if you don't like your therapist, it's awfully hard to get any help from them. And, yes. You know, and that's what often happens at the end of wait list for people is that they, you know, you get, you just, it's, it's a cycle too. Um, I don't, uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, that is the tough thing with like, with mental health It's just the waiting list to get to like a psychologist, especially, um, I've come to learn from talking to a lot of people is, uh, like to be able to get diagnosed by a psychologist so that you kind of know what you want to do, right medications or like the right protocol, or even just to figure out what's going on. That's a huge waiting list. So that's like a, yeah. a big problem. And then, like you said, like a therapist or a counselor, like you have to like that person um i think i got really lucky that i liked the, the one i seen but like yeah it's just like uh yeah and we talked about it about um on your podcast but it too like the resources are are not always there um which is also too like why i wanted to start this podcast was to spread awareness yeah, but as far as i like, wanted to that's why i wanted to go on it's everybody needs to be involved with this kind of stuff to to improve the system it, for sure yeah. um how did the how did you find the uh um the gut health and going through all that stuff uh like affected you mentally uh the one of the biggest things that's really messed with me a lot over time is that i have pretty much permanent appetite loss like even these days when i'm fairly healthy I just don't get hungry most of the time. Um, it's better now, so I can actually eat. But for extended periods, I could not eat. Um, I actually have prescribed cannabis for that reason. Um, Does that help with appetite? Yeah. It's actually one of the original reasons that it was ever prescribed was for AIDS and cancer patients experiencing nausea and appetite loss from either AIDS in general or from chemo. Right. Um, but one of the ways that, that really has messed with me is that I don't like eating with people because of that. I, uh, except with rare exceptions, a few folks that I'm very, very comfortable with, I don't enjoy like communal meals. I feel extremely self-conscious because like, I don't feel like eating. Um, I also really don't like talking with food in my mouth. So like, I, I find the whole, the kind of the timing of those things awkward, but like, it's not, it's not quite to the extent of having a classic eating disorder because it's not entirely mental, but it is definitely partially mental at this point that I have this association with food of gagging, essentially. That's what appetite loss is like. Every time you try and swallow, you gag because people seem to think that uh, eating is entirely voluntary uh, and it's not. You chew and you, you might know this yourself, actually. You push the food to the back of your mouth and then your esophagus takes over from there. And if you don't salivate, if the food doesn't taste good to you, you can't swallow it. Your body just won't do it. Um, so that's kind of what is associated with I overthink it, which I have social anxiety. So I overthink everything if I'm eating with people. And that's what gets stuck in my head is like focusing too much on trying to freaking swallow. Like it's, right. it's yeah. Um, 
So, so is your relationship with food, like, um, how did your relationship with food change over time? Like, I know you just mentioned it there, but like, uh, I imagine you would associate food with pain after a while. Yeah. Very directly sometimes too. Um, yeah. But at the other end, I also associate not eating with pain, you know, because yeah, I have, uh, after I had my surgery, I finally, uh, started getting actually healthier, like not just this medication is going to work for six to 12 months and then you're going to be sick again. Um, it's a loop ileostomy it's called. So they didn't remove my large intestine. Uh, it's still there, but it's disconnected essentially. And that's where most of the inflammation is at. So, um, because of that, I was finally able to gain weight, gain weight. And also, uh, the appetite stuff improved enough that I could finally eat like healthy ish food, you know, comparatively, uh, most Crohn's patients don't have a great diet because I, I can't really eat fibrous stuff very well. Uh, I can do things like berries because the, they just turn into little seeds when you chew it. But if I was to eat like a piece of a mango and didn't chew it properly, it would put me in the hospital because it's all fiber and it doesn't it would just get stuck. Um, so to this day, that would happen right now? Yeah. Unless I, if I chewed it ridiculously, I could eat stuff like that. But by that point, it's really unappealing. Um, so I yeah. try to... It takes longer to to chew it than to... Like, than to cook it. <laughs> yeah, to grow cook it. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> then to grow it. The yeah. celery is taking longer to chew than to... Yeah. Well, actually, that's what I find with like carrots. Uh, I've never, I don't... Some people like raw baby carrots. I can't do it. Um, but uh, so yeah. So, would, sorry, go ahead. I'll ask that later. Yeah. Um, what I was going to get to, though, is after that surgery, I was finally able to eat well in the sense that I could eat uh, food to build muscle. Like I started working out. And since then, I, you mentioned food being associated with pain. And I said, uh, the opposite is also associated with pain. I know if I don't eat, I'm going to start losing weight. Uh, I know if I don't eat, I'm going to go back to looking like that uh, scrawny kid who just got pulled out of Auschwitz after the war. Because <laughs> yeah. That's what I fucking look like off and on. Um, so yeah. I make damn sure to have my protein shakes and my yogurt and apples and banana applesauce and bananas and stuff like that, even if I don't want it. So it's, you know, got to keep on those things because that sort of stuff is great for my mental health. Being able to look in the mirror and like see actual payoff of exercise and, um, and also just look in the mirror and not be like scared. Like, Oh crap. I look like I'm dying, which used to be the case every day. Cause I kind of right. was for a while. Do you find, uh, exercise helps with your gut health? I think so. The, the tough thing is that it's very hard to do when you're in pain because of like yeah. the kind of pain it is right in the abdomen. You have to kind of clench that area an awful lot when you're exercising, you know, yeah. tight core. Um, but yes, when I can exercise, it's, it helps everything. Um, I feel less stressed and more energy. And I know those things combined directly lead to better Crohn's results. Right. So the surgery got disconnected the large intestine. Yeah. And then, so what, what else do they do? So they disconnect it and then. Yeah. So they disconnect, you make an incision right two inches to the right of my belly button. And then you pull the intestine through that hole, cut it. And the two ends are now uh, protruding from the front of my stomach. And I have a bag. Glamorous as it sounds. <laughs> okay. Oh, so the two ends of the large intestine go into the bag? Uh, no, it's the small intestine goes into the bag. The large intestine is just kind of sitting there doing nothing. Okay. Yeah. The point is that um, the hope was that they would be able to reverse it later, but that's never happening. <laughs> My disease is far too aggressive. Right. So um, what are the big things that you've... You talked a little bit about just uh, things you can and can't eat, but what are the what are the big things that you've found that you can you can eat and that that do help and 
stuff like that. I love berries, like yeah. raspberries and blackberries. I eat a pint of them every day. Um, I don't know, just whole foods in general. I love to cook, so I try and uh, do like, um, well, and it's a little counterintuitive. Uh, they always told me specifically that I should eat white bread for the reason that I mentioned about fiber. Um, it's, it's a weird diet for a Crohn's person. Uh, I'm sure uh, someone will message me after this airs telling me how to cure my Crohn's by eating kale. Like that's the kind of response I get every time I mention that I eat a certain way, everybody tells me their way to fix it. Um, but it's not like that. But in terms of things that, that are, that are good, I, I definitely go with like fresh fruit, dairy stuff, uh, anything I can cook myself. I try to. Yeah. Right. Um, and as far as meals, like, uh, like meat and vegetables kind of, um, usually the go-to yeah like i said more fruit than vegetables um because a lot of the veggies i could do things like potatoes and carrots and stuff that cook soft but if it's like i don't think i could eat a salad without ending up in the er yeah no it's hard yeah. to digest well it kind of doesn't digest is even sort of the point of a lot of it like rough yeah. is good for other people but not so much for the crones person yeah no, that's cool, man. That's kind of like the same. Uh, that's kind of the same thing. I'm I'm on too. I eat. Uh, uh, and it was a diet that I found online, but it was just like a smoothie, large smoothie in the morning, just a bunch of uh, bunch of berries, blueberries, bananas, and uh, and then like, and the rest of the meals are just like softly cooked, like meat and vegetables. Um, same kind of thing. I mean, not to your severity, but like, yeah, just whatever is the easiest to digest. Yeah. And like, I found those berries were huge. And so much of it is having a holistic understanding of health and nutrition. Uh, I'm no expert, but I do know a little bit about nutrition. I've been keen on it since I was 11 because of Crohn's. Um, I know you hope you might agree with this. There are no really bad foods uh, and carbs and fat. Neither one of them is evil. Uh, in fact, you very much need both to survive. It's yeah. context. It's what is the rest of your diet? That bag of Skittles isn't a problem. It's are you eating KFC for every other meal? If you're having yeah. that bag of Skittles after like eating like freaking, uh, you know, Dwayne Johnson, The Rock all day, uh, <laughs> Skittles probably aren't going to hurt you. Like he, he has famous cheat days where he eats like five pizzas. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's yeah a lot of it's just like um i can kind of craft a weird personalized diet because if it's lacking in this one end i know to try and make up for it with like um boost is a thing that i supplement my diet with it's a liquid meal replacement that's it's basically baby formula for adults um so stuff like that kind of helps to round out the fact that or I, you know, I take vitamin K supplements because I can't eat a lot of green stuff because it tends to be super fibrous. But right. no one's no one's diet is perfect, and anyone who tells you that they have the perfect diet is just trying to sell you something. Yeah, yeah, for sure. No, yeah, I like what you said. I think it's uh, like when I help people out with diet from a personal training standpoint. I just uh, you can, I like to think of it like at best eighty percent um healthy foods 20 percent kind of what you'd like to eat or like yeah. you can of or just uh some slack with it that's at best it can even be 60 40 and oftentimes it'll be you know it could be 20 80 when to start depends where you are mm -hmm. but uh you know like the from 60 to 80 percent good food and the rest of the time um you know you're not eating maybe you you just eat the things that you'd like to eat um but yeah, I don't know. We can talk about this a long time. I think you also have to like what you eat as well on a day-to-day -day basis. Or you don't you don't stick with it. It's the yeah. same as like you gotta like your workout. If it's boring as hell, you're gonna do it for a week maybe and then quit. Yeah. Yeah, you don't want it to be associated with uh 
with pain and um, mm -hmm. taking up your willpower. You know, yeah. there's only so much willpower that you have in a day and you don't want to spend it on uh, um, things you just need to do to be healthy. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that, that's not a healthy mindset. There's yes. so much that goes into what makes health and it's not just got to hit this certain number of carbs or I'm, you know, a mess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, uh, I went through that weight loss too. I lost, I lost like 50 pounds as well. Um, really, uh, it's really crazy, man. It really just, uh, kind of puts you in a weird mindset you know, just being so like underweight and it's the same thing for me too. It just kind of changed the whole relationship with food. Cause it was like, I would look at food and be like, Oh, that's going to cause me pain. Mm. And then it was also like, I was so hungry all the time, but I couldn't eat because it would cause more pain. And then like not eating was just like horrible. So it was like this constant teeter totter of just trying to survive. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the most normal, natural thing in the world. It's, also a very social thing so when you can't take part in that normally yeah it messes with your head yeah for sure no i'm that must be difficult for you because uh yeah it is very social to gather around around a meal or to go out for a meal or it's a bonding thing i think between humans yeah well that's one of the reasons actually that i love to cook for people so much because then you get all of the nice of everybody sitting around together uh and it's, I find usually when I cook for people, I end up kind of just eating. Well, I'm sure everybody cooks does this actually eating just samples as I go take a roast out of the oven. You know, you're going to carve that thing. You got to do a little quality control to make sure it's good. Oh yeah, for sure. Got to sure. sample the mashed potatoes. I find by the end of that, I'm not really hungry anymore. So then I can just go and enjoy the, the community that comes from gathering with people to eat because that part is, you know, I do love that. And, and it's for nice sure. that people you know tend to compliment my cooking i don't mind that yeah um so what was what was your experience like uh with with mental health and like did you seek out um you said you were kind of diagnosed later on with with panic attacks and, and things of that nature did you mm -hmm. seek help for that see a therapist counselor yeah in university i started going to uh <clears throat> i tried a few different counselors i went to uh I went to the University of King's College in Halifax. They have a really close relationship with Dalhousie. So Dal Health has like a pretty good, actually pretty good service for the students in that sense. They had something like 10 or 11 psychologists employed. And uh, I saw someone there actually for three years straight who was truly fantastic. Um, Sheila McNeil, shout out to Sheila. Uh, she went on to work with veterans who were dealing with like PTSD and stuff. So I- right which is kind of a bummer for me, but I don't blame her for it because that's noble work and uh, someone needs to do it. So, Right. What was the experience like going there? Did, was that, uh, did, it, did it kind of become like a breaking point where you just decided like I need help or was it like something on your mind for a while? And what was it like when you first went there? Well, I started in uh, first year of university. Uh, I was remarkably healthy. I got on medication for Crohn's that put me in full remission for the first time ever. Uh, I was also totally in love with university, love with Halifax, uh, but too much in love with university. I wanted to be a professor and I started spending all of my free time, including the whole summer, just constantly reading, uh, doing work essentially. And I became a complete workaholic. Still am a lot more balanced now, but it was to a point where I could only work uh, from morning until night. And I started having panic attacks about every second of wasted time. So you know that feeling when you get behind on something and then you realize how behind you are and just the kind of anxiety that rises in you? That was just constant. I'd wake up. I woke up literally screaming for a while. Uh, it was quite a, quite a feeling. Uh, not great for my girlfriend at the time. Um, <laughs> she was great, though. She was a great help. <laughs> um, and so that was going on for a little while. And then I was like, okay, I have to go get some help with this. I think, unfortunately, I went looking for medication specifically. Uh, if I remember rightly, I wanted benzos, like Xanax or Ativan or something, uh, because I was 
wanting to deal directly with the symptoms because I had essays I had to write was simply the issue. I started getting behind on papers because I'm a perfectionist and I wouldn't hand anything in unless it was perfect, which is a terrible way to do things, folks. If you're going to be a writer, <laughs> there's no perfect in writing. Um, <laughs> I learned that with journalism. I learned the meaning of good enough. But <laughs> in university, I, I couldn't do that. And it broke my brain. Uh, with the Crohn's, I was able to get extensions indefinitely. Uh, one, they couldn't say no. And two, teachers, they liked me because I tried hard and they wanted me to succeed. But I had one tell me, and this will always stick with me because he was right. He said, I'll give you some rope, but I don't want you to, I don't want to give you enough to hang yourself. And I spent the next four or five years of university hanging myself with that rope, trying to be perfect and just getting more and more behind. Um, somewhere along that line, though, I started going to, to get help at Dell and eventually ended up seeing Sheila McNeil, who was, like I said, really great. She, she, uh, she was really good at the science side of psychology and because I, I like that approach. Uh, I understand that uh, the mindfulness and meditation stuff, I, I know that is a scientific backing to it too. And I'm kind of working towards understanding that stuff. But when people just, that's their only answer. When you go to a counselor or something and before you even finish, they're burning some sage and telling you how to, you know, five things you can see, four things you can touch, all that stuff. I know it works, but if that's their only answer, it doesn't get to me so well. Uh, right. Sheila McNeil would pull out the charts and the graphs and cite the sources and had the science right there that really spoke to me. Um, right. I remember one time I went to, um, see, there's panic attacks are part of what's called the fight or flight response, as I'm sure you know. But it's not just the fight or flight response. It's the fight, flight, or freeze response. Right. Uh, and I had flight panic attacks, the jumping up around, screaming to yourself kind for years. Uh, and then I started, I woke up one morning and I felt like I was dying or having a heart attack, but I was, my pulse was slow. Normal panic attacks, your pulse is just flying. I woke up. I felt like I was drowning, uh, could only kind of breathe, and ended up calling an ambulance, actually. Uh, the only time I've ever done it. They took me to the ER. I was there for 13 hours, and they had no idea what was wrong with me. They did the heart checks and everything. Uh, and they just sent me home. <laughs> uh, I ended up going home. Same thing happened again at like 3 in the morning. I called an ambulance again, got taken back. Um, same thing. They didn't know what to do with me. Someone gave me some out of van to calm me down and send me home again. Next day I went to see Sheila McNeil before I'd even finished my first sentence. She was pulling out a chart, showed me exactly what had happened to me. The hyponomic response, uh, the hypernomic response is your flight panic attack. Hyponomic is your freeze panic attack. And that's no one in the emergency room could figure that out or tell me, but this one person at Dal Health, 30 seconds, not even 30 seconds, 10 seconds. She knew exactly what it was. And anyway, I, I think that kind of the point I'm. That's amazing. With that like, think that about that. Like uh, I have had definitely some really positive experiences in counseling. I've had a lot of disappointment, but uh, somebody like Sheila McNeil, those people are out there and they, they really do make a big difference. She's stuck with me a lot. It's uh, it's amazing how that happened and like, you know, it's almost like you think that we should have more people in the psychology field in the hospitals, mental health people. So I mean, that is, again? I think I missed the start of that. It's amazing that, that how that happened to you, like that's that situation. I think like it just goes to show how we should have more mental health people in the hospitals. Mm. Yeah, because that's that shouldn't be that hard to diagnose. Mm -hmm. And and honestly, I think if that happened now, this was four years ago, I bet it would be a different situation because I, I it does seem like mental health stuff is 
at least the awareness is certainly moving moving forward. I've heard that um, like a lot of people are more and more people are going to the ER um, that are suicidal. And I mean that, you know, a lot of people have came out here and talked about it, but um, and it just goes back to like the beds at unit nine. There's, there's a limited amount of beds and stuff, but there's a lot of people going to doctors that are feeling suicidal. And uh, I think at the end of the day, doctors aren't really trained to, um, to help from a psychology standpoint. Not a lot. It's especially since traditional MD's role is to prescribe things or to refer you somewhere else. And if you're going to an old school doctor, they may have had very limited training in mental health and maybe not much personal interest in learning more later on. Um, you know, these are people who were trained with the DSM four, which is quite different from the DSM five. Um, what is that? The diagnostic and statistical manual of psych, Go analysis, something like that. It's the textbook that psychologists and psychiatrists use for diagnosing people. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, more training would, would be good. And uh, I do think we're headed that way though. I think so too. Yeah. And honestly, man, shows like this make a big difference because, uh, you know, culture has to change before the people making the laws are going to change because we're the ones who push and ideally people will listen. Right. Yeah, man. It's a lot of where my interest these days in journalism comes, comes from too. Uh, been doing a lot of mental health stories, stuff like that, looking at the weaknesses and strengths in the system. Cause I'm, you know, it's not my job to be a, a total negative it's my job to be honest and fair like that's why i'm trying to look for what you know is truly out there i was looking at the bridge the gap website that came out the government put out it's kind of interesting um they have some actual sort of neat stuff in that there's might not be super helpful if you're trying to find an appointment because we talked about the waitlist situation but if you just need some actual information it seems to be good for that like there's some tools uh just i'm not at a point where i need to know the basic information about what's wrong with me anymore <laughs> i've like that's not my issue it's not that i need to go and get this off my chest i've i've already gotten it off my chest on too many tables <laughs> it's more that i need to know how to put it back on there i guess um right <laughs> yeah yeah. Yeah, I know that's good. I haven't I haven't visited the website, but I heard that on the radio the other day. Um, but I think that's really cool. That's really awesome. Just anything that gives people more information and help them understand uh, themselves and what's going on, because that's a big thing too. I think is like the confusion. Yeah. Because when you're having mental health, um, you know, struggles, it's you just uh, it's it's often oftentimes people I think feel confused and they don't understand it and they. Uh, and then there's the whole thing of like feeling like you're alone and um, no one else going through it. And then isolation. It's just good to, to really understand, you know, this is a, it's a normal thing you're feeling. Yeah. It's okay. But it's uh, good to have like a single landing page too. Like for the reason you just mentioned that when you're in the thick of a crisis, it's not easy to do research. <laughs> no. Yeah. It's not easy to, can't read a paper <laughs> no yeah you're not going to make through the abstract let alone you know? <laughs> yeah exactly so it's yeah and it needs to be they have a, a website for kids too which is an excellent idea because that's a whole other ballpark um yeah, yeah. and yeah I, I haven't had a good chance to explore the whole thing yet but I'm, I'm curious i plan on doing a couple stories on that too i think it'd be yeah yeah man for sure that'd be awesome so speaking of that, so like kind of transitioning to to now, you you went to university and then you came here and you're going you're in the journalism program now. Mm -hmm. Um and um from what I can see, um, you know, you do the um OJT podcast and uh 
and you're doing news stories, you're, you're very, very busy and very, very, uh, very active. Too busy sometimes. <laughs> so is, uh, is workaholic or just working a lot? Is that something that you struggle with now or you're mindful of? Yeah. Uh, it's definitely a problem. I, <laughs> it's <laughs> I'm a little more balanced in it now. It's not yeah. just all school work all the time, but it is work most of the time, unfortunately. Uh, right. I have a lot of anxiety and intrusive thoughts when I'm not doing stuff. Um, it's been a weird, kind of hard couple of years. Um, or more of it. The last couple of years have been a bit better after several really, really terrible years, um, which has kind of left me in a place where I don't, I don't know what to do with downtime. Um, I, like I, I do make sure to take my weekends off from schoolwork, but I'm also doing like chores and errands and trying to read and stuff. Right. Um, but it's also like, I don't know, I'm, I'm 26. Uh, I kind of have a lot to do, even if it's not just making stuff for myself to do. I live alone. I don't expect my parents or a girlfriend or whatever to cook and clean for me. I take pride in doing that stuff myself. I will admit that mom gets some groceries for me sometimes that I go and get from their house because she gets the deals and stuff and likes to do it. But I try my best to be as independent nice. as health allows me. Like that's the, the downside of that is that it's always, you know, it's hard to be completely independent when you're still sick. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's a push and pull, right? Because you want to be independent, but at the same time, it's like you're just holding like your pillars of health together. Yeah. Burnout is very real. So did, do you find that affects your health? Like burning out? Do you find it affects your gut in particular? Yeah. Yeah, your I definitely crumbs? notice it. Starts to get irritated. Um, yeah, and it's not like a direct one-to-one -one kind of cause and effect thing. There's so many factors with gut health. Uh, yeah. Might just be bad timing. Like that's a long, smooth muscle that's doing a lot of moving around. If there's a bit of inflammation, you never know what's going to make it hurt. Um, but yeah, like, there's a clear relation to stress. Um, you probably know this, that when the fight or flight response kicks in, blood flow switches from certain organs to others and it goes away from, uh, I think it goes away from like your stomach and stuff to other parts to make different things work better. And if you're constantly going back and forth from that state, it fucks up your digestion. Like uh, stress eating is not natural because when you're stressed, that part of your body is actually kind of down, uh, downplayed. So it's, yeah, it's weird. I don't stress eat. I kind of do the opposite. I stress starve. Stress fast. Yeah. Um, so um, I was going to say something. Um, I think balance is different for everybody, you know? Mm. I think that doesn't necessarily mean like uh, you're not busy. You know what I mean? Like I think people sometimes like it's so it's such an individual thing, but people sometimes think it's not, you know, like what works for mm -hmm. one won't work for the other, where there's like some people like to be more busy and uh, some people like to have more downtime and like, what is downtime? Right. Because then like, yeah. if you're doing like a hobby or if you're reading, like you said, or if you're doing chores, like those things can actually be very beneficial for your mental health as well. If there yeah. are things that you enjoy doing. Right. So um, I, that's something I found in my life where it's like uh you know, like actually being productive, but doing things that like I like to do is actually better for me than, than, um, you know, just doing nothing or something. Yeah. Especially if you can manage to make it both. Like I, I really like doing the dishes and listening to the news or listening to a podcast because, uh, I actually kind of, I kind of like doing the dishes. I find it satisfying. Uh, and it, you can make it, I don't know, just whistle while you work. You know, if you can make it fun, it doesn't always feel like a chore or an errand. And adulting is 
stuff we have to do every day. It doesn't have to be like, you know, the heaviest task in the world. For sure. I find I, I enjoy a bit of downtime at the end of days. Like once I've gotten some stuff done, the kind of satisfaction of a hard day's work at that point, then I'm ready to just watch the Sopranos, which I've been doing lately. Right. Yeah. 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 For sure. I think that's, uh, yeah, it's like, it's, it's well-earned, right? Or as I yeah. think we're sometimes like you get in a trap, I'm just talking like generally like where your mental health starts to slip, I think is like when you're just doing too much downtime, that's not earned. And then it's like, yeah. to have that on your mind in the back of your mind, um, I should be doing this or I'm behind on that. You know, it's like, you're not really mm-hmm. enjoying what you're doing. So that is precisely what, what happens to me if I'm trying to, yeah. And it's earning it, but not even in the sense that like, I got to make my money. You know, it's that, um, I take it's a genuine mental. pride. Yeah. It's that I feel good about doing things. Some of it's that I feel that compulsion to be constantly doing stuff. Some of it's that I just like doing stuff. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of that comes from Crohn's. I have spent so much time on the sidelines, so much time stuck in bed, shivering with a heating pad. Cause I can't get up. I'm in so much pain when I can get up. It's hard to get me down again. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's, uh, that's a very enlightening perspective. And, you know, I felt the same way in my own way. And it's just like, you have a whole new appreciation for the baseline. Like, yeah. I'm, ex- I'm excited to be baseline, you know? Yeah. Like, I, like, I would have killed to be baseline at so many points. Yeah. But it gives you, like, a whole new perspective on life where you're just, uh, you're just happy to be in it <laughs> and really Seriously. in it. Well, that's... I got a car a few months ago, so I don't walk to school every day. But when I did walk to school, right after I'd had that surgery, every day I'd walk and kind of list uh, some gratitude things. Number one was always my health. And Mm -hmm. like, I think a lot of folks take it for granted just what it is to just to be able to walk five minutes away and not have to think about it. Like there's been so many times where I couldn't even walk five minutes and like as a 20 something year old person who should be like historically fit enough to be in the military and go to war. Like that's, you know what I mean? Like I would have been, you know, a hundred years ago, they wouldn't have sent me to war. Like not that I want to go fight in world war one, but knowing that that's, you know, that they would have said, no, you're not fit. Yeah. It messes with you. It does for sure. Yeah. You just feel, uh, yeah, you feel so, um, you feel so held back, you know? Yeah. It's especially tough. Uh, I didn't notice it so much around like early twenties, but now I'm 26 and, uh, I have a couple of friends who are engaged. I have others who have jobs. Like everybody has a job, um, who are doing like, you know, successful career things. And I'm like, finally gonna graduate college you know like yeah and i know everyone's on their own journey it's not a race i have to remind myself that all the time but it's just frustrating knowing that a lot of what i haven't been able to do is not from lack of trying or it's from trying the wrong way like that's where the workaholism comes in again where you need to spend 14 hours a day writing essays Maybe spend a yeah. little time cleaning. <laughs> yeah. Maybe go for a walk. <laughs> Remember yeah. that there is stuff outside. Yeah. Go ahead, Taurus. Um, yeah, man. And uh, I think that is it, though. I think everybody's in their own journey. And, um, you know, it is interesting, though, that, like, especially with what you're doing, you're just able to put all that experience into what you're doing, you know, with your stories and with your, um, your perspective, you know, I think about that, like, even with this, like if, uh, if someone close to me didn't commit suicide, I wouldn't have been able to, I wouldn't be able to have this conversation we're having right now or, or all the other ones. Yeah. I wouldn't have the perspective enough to do it. And I would, I wouldn't have like probably the interest, um, 
or like just whatever that was the spark to, to to take the leap to just to do it. So yeah. it's interesting how sometimes things in the long run, um, you know, they work out in a weird way where it actually, you know, sets you up for what you're you're gonna do. Yeah, it's true. Like that's why I think I do a pretty good job of health stories like with journalism because uh, sometimes I, I admit I'm at a risk of being too close to it, but having that empathy, I guess, where, you know, I don't just theoretically get it. I actually get it. <laughs> like when people talk about dealing with the health system and stuff, like I know what they're talking about. Um, and, or just when I haven't interviewed anybody who has Crohn's, but if people talk about like their illness, you know, I can at least relate to the fact that I know what it's like to miss stuff. I know what it's like to have to cancel things you were going to do. Uh, I know what it's like to have to replan your entire life every three fucking weeks. Um, so it's, yeah, having, having painful experience, it, it gives you understanding that other people don't. It's why so many like social workers grew up rough, you know, they, they get it. Yeah. Yeah. It gives you perspective. And then, um, you know, you're just able to, if you choose to, you're able to use it to help others. Yeah. Um, that seems like a good place to, uh, turn it off, man. I just want to say thank you so much for coming on and, um, and opening up. No, well, thank you, man. It's hard to do, but, uh, I, I really appreciate the, a nice place to do this. It's important. Well, thanks so much, man. I'm going to give you, uh, <laughs> I'm going to give you some salt from our, uh, our sponsor here. You can use this to cook. So we got four different kinds of salts here from the, uh, Prince Edward Island Sea Salt Company. So, um, 40% of all proceeds go to mental health programming at BEI. So everybody go check those, check them out. The Prince Edward Island Sea Salt Company. And um, yeah, man, I just want to say thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you, Matt. Keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> you too, man. Thank you.